Hello and welcome to Physics 203 and this is College Physics uh, 2 and in this semester we're going to be looking at um, some broad topics. Uh, specifically we're going to start with electricity and magnetism uh, before moving on into optics and to that end we're going to start with uh, electric forces and fields and in the picture you have before you you'll see a rod and it's attracting some paper fillings and you've probably seen phenomena like this before. Another common example would be something like a balloon uh, that's been rubbed on some hair or some uh, cloth or fur and then you uh, stick it over your head and uh, your hair might stand up. And this is akin to uh, something like this where you have um, you know perhaps uh, somebody with longer hair um, and you'll see that the hair can be attracted to a variety of different objects. Uh, often the uh, plastics and rubber are uh, very good at collecting um, what we call static charge, right? And so this chapter is going to focus on um, the phenomena that occur as a result of static electricity, how static electricity is collected, what static electricity is in the first place, and what is this thing that we call charge. So let's start there for the moment. What are the properties of electric charges? Um, we didn't really have a sense of what electric charge was until uh, the 1700s, and one of the pioneers uh, who looked into the phenomena was uh, indeed uh, Benjamin Franklin, the inventor and statesman. And as a result of uh, his investigations and the investigations of others, it was determined that if you rub certain objects uh, with certain substances and hold those objects near other objects and substances, you would see weird things happen like hair stand up or um, paper start to move across a desk and things of that nature. And through experimentation, they realized that sometimes uh, paper fillings would attract uh, to different objects. But then if I took two of the same objects, say I took two uh, glass rods that I'd rubbed with wool, and both of these rods would attract paper fillings, they might repel each other. And that's the case that you see in the right picture there. Um, but then if I also have a different substance, say instead of a glass rod, I have a rubber rod that I've rubbed with some sort of substance, then that it might attract the glass rod. So we have different things that attract and different things that repel. And what the conclusion was is that there are two types of charge. And further, like charges repel and opposites attract. So if you have two things that are attracting, you can conclude that somehow they are charged and they're oppositely charged. And if they repel, then they are um, uh, like charged. So that's a brief overview initially of what charge itself is. Okay? And how we actually transfer charge, as I've alluded to, is by rubbing objects with other objects. In many cases, we're going to rub uh, some sort of rod, be it glass or rubber, uh, things of that nature, with something like fur or silk, um, some sort of cloth. That often uh, is a very good way to collect charge. You've probably shocked yourself uh, by walking across a room and then touching a door handle. And what often happens there, particularly if you're not wearing shoes, is that your socks will interact with the carpet the same way that wool, uh, a wool cloth will interact with either a rubber or glass rod, and charge will start collect on your person. And that excess charge is going to just sit uh, in you, as long as it's not too much, as we'll discover in a few chapters, but a little amount of charge can, can uh, reside in you, but then when you touch the door handle, the door handle is a conductor, and we'll define what a conductor is here shortly, but you touch the door handle and that gives the charge a place to escape to, and that's what actually gives you the shock. So the act of charging itself is often done when two substances will rub together. 
So you may be wondering, okay, we have these two different types of charges, and just what is charge in the first place? And the answer is actually very subtle. You've probably heard of protons and electrons, protons being positively charged and electrons being negatively charged. And those are the two types of charged particles that uh, reside in the uh, atom. Those are the two simplest atomic particles. And they're each charged, and they have opposite charges. Again, protons are positive and electrons are negative. And they both have the same magnitude of charge. In other words, one proton will carry just as much positive charge as one electron will of negative charge. Now, just how much charge is this? Well, in the SI system of units, the unit for charge is called the Coulomb, after uh, the French physicist from the 17 and 1800s who discovered Coulomb's law. However, that in and of itself does not tell you just how much an individual electron or um, proton might carry. The standard unit is that one charge of uh, the charge on one proton or the charge on one electron in magnitude is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So what this means is, if I have one coulomb of charge, then I have an enormous number of charges, an absolutely enormous number of charges, okay? Um, and so each individual charge carries a very, very small amount relative to one coulomb, okay? It's 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. 1.60219, but for our purposes, we're almost always just going to use 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. Now, there are different types of substances, um, and we generally classify these substances into two broad categories. We have insulators and we have conductors. And glass is typically an insulator, while copper, uh, things like copper wire or nickel or aluminum, things like that, are typically uh, conductors. Now, what's the difference between the two? An insulator is an object that does not necessarily allow charge to flow very freely whereas a conductor is an object that allows charge to flow very freely. Now, what's actually happening? When we have charges that are moving and charges that are flowing, it is usually the electrons themselves that are uh, flowing or moving, whereas the protons are not. Okay, Usually the protons will stay stationary, but the electrons are the particles with the mobility. You can also have a case where we have what are called semiconductors. And a semiconductor is something that's somewhat in between an insulator and a conductor. It doesn't quite uh, completely insulate charge from flowing like an insulator does, but it doesn't quite conduct uh, electricity quite as well as normal conductors do. And here on the left, you see a little chunk of silicon, and on the right, you would see a, a chunk of germanium, and these are two common, what we call semiconductors, and these are often used in your personal electronics. Uh, these are what help make your cell phone and your computer uh, tick the way that they do. So semiconductors are really, really important, uh, particularly for uh, electronics, but uh, they aren't quite either an insulator and they're not quite a conductor either. So how can I charge an object with a charge object? So let's say I've already taken my rod and I've rubbed it with some fur, and how can I then charge something else, okay? And there are a few different methods, and the first method is called conduction, charging by conduction. So say we've taken a rod and we've rubbed it with some fur, and the result is that the rod is now negatively charged, so the rod will have an excess of electrons on it. I can then hold that rod next to a conducting sphere, okay? So uh, imagine a giant metal ball, like a cannonball, okay? Made of iron or something of that nature, right? Now, most macro, uh, macroscopic objects are going to be neutral uh, by default. In other words, they're gonna have just as many electrons as they do protons. So they're electrically neutral. So our cannonball is initially electrically neutral. However, when I bring the rod close to the cannonball, 
the negative charges on the rod are going to repel the negative charges on the cannonball. And remember, it's the negative charges that can move around. And so the negative charges are going to collect on the opposite end of the ball uh, from the rod, leaving the um, end of the ball close to the rod with a net positive charge. And then if I bring the two objects in contact, because the ball is a conductor, the charge from the rod can flow onto the ball. And uh, because the closest point to the rod is a positive charge, is a collection of positive charges, then it will actually draw some charge of the uh, negative type off of the rod and onto the sphere. And so now, when I pull the rod away, both the rod and the sphere will be negatively charged. So this is one way that I can charge a, an object uh, through conduction. Again, a neutral object is going to have equal numbers of positive and negative charges, but the charges are going to redistribute themselves when I bring a charged object in the vicinity of my neutral object. And charging by induction, on the other hand, is when I don't necessarily bring the objects in contact with each other, like conduction, but now I'm going to do what's called grounding. And grounding just simply means I give the place, I give a place uh, for the charges on the sphere that can flow, a place to flow to. And typically what we mean by ground is a large repository of charge. So when you ground a wire in a circuit, for example, what physically is happening is the wire is connected to a point it just goes down into the earth and it allows the, the charges to dump out. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we call it grounding. But you can have different things that are grounds. All a ground at the end of the day is, is a large space where it can accept excess charge without really changing the uh, amount of charge in the ground. And uh, uh, an analogy would be, think of like an ocean, okay? Um, if, if I have an ocean and I put just a few more drops of water, then I really haven't changed the water level. So a ground is an area that has so much charge already that adding a few extra charges is not really going to change its electric properties. And then once I remove the ground, then my object is charged. And nothing had to come in contact with each other other than the wire for the ground to come in contact with the sphere. And again, this is called charging by induction. So now, since this is a physics class, what about the math? Well, I'm going to briefly introduce you to Coulomb's Law in this video, and then the next video will actually do stuff with it. Okay? But I'm going to introduce it to you first. So this is Coulomb's Law, and this describes the force between two charged objects. Okay? Now in this class, we're going to use Q's to denote our charges. So Q1 would be the first charge, Q2 will be the second charge. Right? And there are a lot of parallels here between this uh, formulation for electric force and Newton's universal law of gravitation, if you recall, Newton's universal law of gravitation said F equals G M1 M2 over R squared. And the G was a constant of proportionality. Well, here we have F equals K Q1 Q2 over R squared. And K is a constant of proportionality. This is no accident. This is a, there's some very deep reasons for why these two equations have uh, the, the same type of structure. Uh, but this wasn't expected when it was first discovered. Uh, but a couple of things about Coulomb's Law. Okay, Coulomb's Law provides a way to calculate the force between two charged objects. Now, this electric force is going to be directed along a line joining the two particles, just as we drew lines connecting our masses when we did the uh, gravitational force. It's proportional to the product of the magnitudes of the charges, just as the gravitational force is proportional to the product of the masses. 
and it's attractive if the charges are of opposite sign, and it's repulsive if they have the same sign. So that's why we put the absolute values around the charges from the get-go. We then assign the uh, direction after we look at which charges are positive and which charges are negative. And that value for Ke has the number 8.98 times 10 to the 9th. We'll just typically use 9.